Welcome everyone to the PJ's Cast. I'm your host Pierce, alongside my good pals Dylan and Reagan. Uh, how are we doing today? It's it's been a while since the three of us have recorded a podcast episode, like at least a few months, like before mm-hmm. the the end of the the season. So how are we doing? Monday, Monday, Monday. I'm doing great. <laughs> this Monday, Monday, Monday. The flu season, cast. But getting through it. <laughs> it is flu season. My whole office is sick right now at work. Where I'm the only one that hasn't caught it. My boyfriend doesn't get sick time at work, so they either have to take a vacation day, which they don't get a lot of, or just like take an unpaid day off or just like fight through it. So his, his whole office is like sick right now. And then someone just was like, Oh, yeah, I had just had COVID, by the way. So we're like, mm, We probably have COVID. So that's great. But I hate when people just like nonchalantly bring that up. It's like, Yeah, I might have had COVID. It's like, Cool. Just got the whole office. Just home, yeah, yeah, for real. Oh, yeah, by the way, I tested positive, and I was like, Wonderful. Awesome. Why were you hanging out with us? <laughs> oh, well. Um, I hope you feel better. What do they again. say? We're yeah, all I feel a lot better, better today than I did, like, over the weekend, but I'm still just, like, super stuffy. But, oh, well. <laughs> for show, sure, for show. Sure. So before we get into anything, the the last podcast we recorded, I think, was August twenty fifth, and um, I don't even know how I would like to start with this because one, this is almost a month ago, and there's been so many like rest in peace to Johnny Gaudreau and his brother Matthew Gaudreau, like truly awful stuff. I don't even know like what to do because there has been so many great commemorations, like we saw people in Calgary going to the Saddle Dome to pay their respects for Johnny Gaudreau, same with Columbus, like poor Columbus fans because it was that goalie a few years ago, I think his name was Matisse Kivelnix, also tragically passed away, just I can't even, it almost feels disingenuous to like talk about the Blue Jackets at all, like like I don't know, just truly awful, rest in peace to, to Johnny and Matthew, we hear so many bad things about hockey culture and rightfully so we want to talk about that a lot but it sounds like Johnny and Matthew were you know positive bright spots in hockey culture you know there's so many funny stories and great heartwarming stories we heard about Johnny and Matthew over Twitter or wherever else and yeah just I don't even know like being a family member or a friend having to even begin to think about that the day before their sister's wedding just truly horrible stuff and i don't want to like spend too long on this but um if you are going out for the night for a drink there's so many options like it, there's no excuse to get in your car and drive when you're intoxicated there's so many different methods uber taxi lyft whatever the hell like there's so many yeah if you're just you're getting in your car intoxicated you're just you're just looking for bad things to happen. So that's all I want to say. I don't know if you guys have anything else to say or we can take, move on to the, to the next topics here. I I did want to say a couple of things. One, if you drunk drive, it's the most selfish thing you could possibly do. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. It is 2024 call an Uber call friend. Mm -hmm. Literally there are so many options today. It's not necessary. Um, I literally so paid. Like, I literally paid for my boss's car when he got towed because he was trying to drive home drunk, and I was like, "I'm not fucking letting this happen. I'm sorry. I will pay for your car if it gets towed. I don't care. I'm. I'd rather pay 180 bucks to deal with the story in the morning." Um, That's one thing my dad always told me was, "It's out. It's a lot cheaper either just pay for an Uber, pay to get your car back if it gets towed, than to pay the ticket for a DUI, or to even just risk life, other like, people's lives." Yeah. At risk. Bingo. 100%. And I wanted to touch on Gaudreau as a whole because I think um, he's going to be remembered as one of the, like, everyone always talks about Patrick Kane as, like, you know, kind of starting the revolution for the small skilled player. Johnny mm-hmm. Gaudreau is the real way. Like, he and Brayden Point are where that real revolution started. Johnny Gaudreau was, well, the fourth round pick and yeah, lit it up at Boston. Yeah. Yep. Lit it up at Boston College. Had a great career in Calgary. Uh, people are not going to talk about it enough, but that was he was one of the first people to choose Columbus and free agency. That does not happen often. Um, and everyone just... was puzzled about it. And to kind of go further to the point, is because of family. Like he was such, seemed like such a family man. He had. Um, that was why I wanted to go to Philly, remember? Yeah. And then another kid on the way, like, oh my Lord, I can't even imagine his wife, his family. Oh, just truly awful. Like, with, yeah. Well, that she had found out like a week before that she was pregnant again. Like, I can't even imagine. It's heartbreaking. But um, 
you know, the, the, everyone's being very supportive, which is nice. Um, mm -hmm. It's one of the few times you see all the cesspool of the internet come together for a good cause. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like, like you said, like the, oh, sorry. I kind of going off what you're saying. It's how like every like league has like kind of come together and like had like something for him and like, their Dude, family. LeBron James tweeted about, I think I saw something from Mike Trout, like all these big athletes from other sports were like, yeah, that's like just awful that it happened, but. I mean, even when WWE was in Calgary, like it was like a week or two after they even mm -hmm. like, like uh, Sami Zayn came out in a Gaudreau jersey and then they had a whole thing about him. And I was like, well, now I'm crying again. <laughs> Literally, no. I started tearing up when Sam, I, and it had to be Sammy too. It did. It really did. Um, mm -hmm. It's it sucks. And like, I I don't even want to get in the on ice aspect, but like, I feel terrible for people like Sean Monahan, like literally signing Columbus to play with his best friend. And he was on, I think, the podcast with Pete Blackburn. He was just raving about Johnny Gaudreau and like how excited he was to play with them. And then like, I think less than a week later, that happens. So just. It's really awful stuff. Like, I think I said it earlier. I don't know if I said it, like, while we were doing this or right before the podcast. It's just, I don't even know how you can talk about the Columbus Blue Jackets with what happened. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know if it's, if it's right to say, like, they just deserve a mulligan. Like, if they have another bad, like, I, I don't know. There, it's, it's, there's going to be that asterisk, really, unfortunately. It, it, it's frustrating, too, because, like, you know, like, the reporters are reporting. It's like, yeah, Columbus is looking for toxic forward help. And it's just like, fuck. Like, that sucks so much. Like, uh, they lost a key part of their leadership core. Like, he was great in the community in Columbus and Calgary, from what I heard. Mm -hmm. Like, he mm -hmm. always gave back. Um, it's heartbreaking, man. There's another way to put it. And yeah. rename the Lady Bang to the Johnny Gaudreau Trophy. Like, no one gives a shit about Lady Bang. But, like, give, give him something. Yeah, and there's just so many, like – great stories of him being a great guy so many funny stories too i think there was one where obviously a small guy i think it was during the draft combine he would like put pucks in i think in a suit to make his weight go higher and there was like another one where i think he he was very good close friends with with kevin hayes and i think the story goes like oh he was just trying to put his check into an atm or whatever like when he first got he's like that's not what you do or whatever <laughs> it was so yeah it it really sucks we have to like commemorate Johnny Gaudreau under and and his really his brother Matthew who was working his who I believe played in college hockey too, played in the USHL. It sucks that we have to kind of commemorate them under these circumstances. Yeah, but I think he played in the ECHL for mm -hmm. a little bit too because I feel like there was a time like the Fuel were playing his team or something and I was like, is that the same like Gaudreau that I'm thinking of? And I had to Google it and I was like, oh hey, it is. That's really cool. Um, I think he was coaching somewhere, like the last. Yes, I believe that's what it was. Yeah, I probably should have looked that up beforehand, but um, yeah, just truly awful stuff. Always hug your hug your close ones because you never know not to be like doubt or anything. But like life is life is so precious. Like just enjoy enjoy every second of it. Live it like Johnny and Matthew Gandrew, who just sounded like two great guys. And yeah, again, like all. Oh, all like my love and and thoughts and prayers and like respect and like to the, the to the Gaudreau families and any families and friends that were directly affected by it. Like I hope they find like get the help they need and the find the peace and solace because I just like and I can't even start to imagine what they're still going through right now. So yeah, again, unless you guys have anything more, we can uh, move on to the next topic. Yeah, we can move on. Um, yeah. If you ever want to see fun Johnny Gaudreau highlights, go look at the year he had 110 or 117 points. That 2019 season, or was it 2019 or 2021 with him and Lindholm? I think it was 2022, 21, 22. That's what it was. That's what it was. Yeah. But that line was one of the best five on five lines the sport's ever seen. Um, yeah. The highlights Gaudreau, are Lindholm, genuinely a joy. Chuck, yeah. And even that 2015 line with him and Hudler and Monahan. Oh, like, the what the kit? The, what was what were the Flames called? Like, I think it was the Cardiac Flames. They called them but like when they made that miracle run. They made it to the second round, lost to Anaheim. But I always think of I think it was Game Three. Ducks were up two nothing, empty net, three two. Anaheim was leading, and then Johnny Gaudreau. I think with like 20 seconds left, short side snipe. I'm like the balls to do that because if you miss the net and it goes down the other way, like you're losing that game. So I, I always think of that just the ball. And I'm pretty sure he went on to score the overtime winner, if I'm not mistaken. So yep. 
a truly an electric player and he'll be horribly missed and sa- same to his brother who sounded like he was really moving up in the in the hockey world so yeah um so we'll get on to the topics that we have for the show um Nick Felino was named Blackhawks captain the first captain that they have had since Jonathan Taves what do we think I I don't know if it was like a worst kept secret but I'm like I feel we all could have seen this coming um I thought I was going to see more, oh, why not Bedard right now? But I feel, at least from when I logged into Twitter, everyone was just like, oh, yeah, great, great choice. And we've said this so many times over the show over the past year where Nick Foligno was basically the de facto captain. Like, the way he just came in there. Like, he was a leader, I think, in Ottawa when he was there. He was a captain in Columbus. He was a huge part of the Bruins' leadership before he got traded here. And, yeah, now he's took it on captain. Now it's just a formality that he's got the C on his chest. And it sounds like he did a little bit of co-GMing in the offseason because it sounded like he got a lot of, um, you know, he was making phone calls to a lot of guys. I think it was Alec Martinez that said that Nick Foligno called him. So he's had such a huge part in the on-ice stuff and the off-ice stuff. So honestly, great for him. If anyone has any doubts, just watch the video that the Blackhawks Twitter account put up. See his kids come in and give him his jersey and you just see how like everyone loves and respects him so just a truly truly a great choice i don't know what you if you guys have any more thoughts to that but yeah 100 percent um i he was another big reason bertuzzi signed here bertuzzi wasn't even thinking mm-hmm. about chicago until felino called him yeah they were um, i think they were teammates in boston in boston bit, yeah. yes sir mm-hmm. um yes, sir. like i said on ice off ice leader literally been like a dad to the kids on the team yeah um, He's done so much for Bedard and Korchinski and Nazar and all them. Um, <clears throat> he takes the pressure off Bedard, I think, because, like, mm-hmm. everyone could want to give him the captaincy at 19. I mean, they but, could, like, but what's the point? Like, give him a couple it, years. He's going to get it. He's a kid, dude. Let him grow yeah. up a little bit. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, um, I don't know. He's going to get it. He's, he's going to get it when he signs his yeah. extension. He's going to get it. Yeah. When the like, I already know when he's getting it. He's getting it when the hundredth season commences in twenty twenty six. That's exactly when he'll get it. Um, and that will be great. They'll probably do a whole rebrand when he gets to be the captain. Like I've been saying that for a couple years now. Um, but I mean, I, there's nothing to complain about there. Uh, he he leads by example. Um, he put up better offensive numbers than I could have imagined playing with Bedard last year. Half a point per game, 37 points in 74 games. Yeah, not bad. Can't (laughs) ask for much more. Can't ask for much more there. Literally will stick up for any teammate. Um, I think he brings the best out of guys like Seth and all them Mm because, um, you know, it brings a different type of leadership quality. I think like, you know, we can have a bunch of lead by example guys like we did with like Kane and all them, but you know, a vocal leader can go a long way. And I think you see that a lot in this league. And um, he's done it before. Like he did it in Columbus for what, half mm-hmm. a decade, something like that. Yeah, um, for at least a few years there. Yeah. Can't complain. Can't complain. And if his body starts to give out towards the end, it's almost like we have a shit ton of cap space. <laughs> and he can, you know, get paid four mil just to be the captain on the fourth line. I'd may okay with that. Yeah. I just feel like, Bedard is still so young and he's only going into his second season. So why even bother putting so much extra pressure on him when he already has enough pressure as it is. Um, And like you guys have both already said, like Felino was basically the captain last year. So I think he's just a great vet and a great leader. And I think he's great for all the young guys in the locker room because he has such a young team and I think it's the right move. Yeah, like he yeah. just turned 19. I'm trying to think of the headspace I was in when I was when I was 19. Well, I was 19 when I started this podcast. So, well, like the amount of maturing I've had to do in like the past few years, almost being 24, like having to be Connor Bedard, deal with all that pressure because he lived up to all the expectations last year. But it also sounds like he really enjoyed his offseason, not having to deal with any like you know interviews or having to be in front of the camera. Just sounds like he's a very like you know, quiet guy who, like, who, who I mean, his hockey is his life, and it's not like he was training in, in Vancouver. So, yeah, just to give another year or two, at least one year, for, you know, him not to be the main guy. Like, that time is going to come. It's not a matter of if. It's more a matter of when, and that's probably going to be within the next couple of years. So we'll have a chance to enjoy Connor Bedard with a C on his chest for a decade plus. You know, let's enjoy what Nick Foligno has done to help come into – the Blackhawks organization and really help 
be a change of the culture because I've said so many times the past couple of years, like building a good team, yeah, like, but like changing the culture of this organization was all it's been through the past decade. And plus, that's just as big as doing and uh, naming Nick Felito captain. That's part of that, of like changing the culture. And then once he handles that, hands that over to Bedard, hopefully this team is better and at least, you know, contending for playoff spots. So, yeah, I don't. I didn't really see anyone complain about it anyways. There are probably a few people that were, but yeah, just all across the board. I think I saw Pete Blackford saying like ultimate professional and like, so yeah, good, good for Nick Foligno. Uh, I don't I know if there's really much to add there. Yeah, yes, I definitely saw a couple people like, and like one of the replies is like, why wouldn't you just give it to Bedard now? And I'm like, cause he's 19. He's still in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> like, have you made attention the last season? Like, I, I don't know. That's the that. I'm oh, sorry. I was gonna say that. That's the thing with the Hawks too. It's like I feel like when he gets the captaincy, that's when this team's gonna be ready to roll as a contender. It's two years down the line. All these prospects will have two more years of development. Probably have another top ten pick in the in the cupboard. Um, obviously, they have two more firsts this year. They might get another first at the deadline if they trade someone. I don't think they will, but you never know. Like Connor Murphy could just fetch a first or something. You never but, know how the season's gonna go. Yeah, quite literally. But um. I think it's better to have him lead the new regime in two years than lead this transitional one that we got right now. Yeah. <clears throat> Agreed. Um, I don't know if there's anything more to touch on that or we can actually get into some some on-ice stuff. Um, no preseason, preseason games have been played yet by the Blackhawks. I think they play the Red Wings. Do they play them in Milwaukee or is that another game they play in Milwaukee? I can't remember. I don't remember. Um, because I know they're going back there. I just can't remember if it's again. It's in a week. It's in October. Oh, okay. So yeah, it's not not this week. They play play the Red Wings, but there has been there was a prospect tournament. They played against the Blues, played against the Wild. Um, yeah. So I don't know if you guys like caught any of the highlights. It sounded like we had. You don't have Connor Bedard this year, so you don't have like just the one focal point to 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 watch for the games. But it sounds like Frank Nazar was was really doing well, and obviously coming in. For me, that's almost the biggest thing coming into this camp is who's going to take over the second line role because we know what Connor Bedard's going to do, especially now that he has line mates around him. You would think that Alex Vlasic is going to take another step, and Seth Jones is still going to be a top pairing defenseman. And if you get even the same like goaltending as last year, like this team is going to improve. But I feel if Frank Nazar is at second line center, if he just really takes it off and says, fuck it, it's mine. Like it's no one else's. I feel that just adds another like element to this team where it's like, okay, maybe you're not making the playoffs, but it's like, Ooh, but you know, they're Blackhawks are battling come de- December and January, as opposed to just, you know, tr- dropping dead like they have the past couple of years. So I, Frank Nazar is obviously the big name to watch, but I don't know if you guys watch scrimmages, if there's maybe some other guys that, you know, have kind of impressed you. Cause I got, well, I got a couple more names as well. And I wonder if they're maybe the same. Yeah. AJ Spilacy, um or Spelacy, mm-hmm. however you say his name. He, yeah. Uh, he seemed to impress a, in a big way in camp. Um, you know, they're already talking about if he might get playing time to AHL this year, which would be pretty cool. Okay. Um, that's what's the eligible. I don't know if he's eligible. Is he OHO? That's what I'm trying to think. I'm like, I don't think he went to college. I think he's well, he, the, you know, if he plays, he's playing his way into a roster spot right now, the way they're icing the team because he's playing with NHL players in camp. Mm-hmm. Um, that he should be a dead giveaway. Yeah. Um, but besides him, I, I thought Del Mastro showed some moments. Um, mm-hmm. you know, I, he was. I don't know why he was getting so many offensive looks because that's not going to be his role in the NFL. But that's okay or NFL. NFL. Yeah, NFL that's okay. No, yeah. I know, right? He's going to be a quarterback. <laughs> Get excited, guys. Um, Nick Lardis, I think you know that one timer is mm-hmm. still amazing. Um, yeah. He, is he going to be in the AHL this year? Or is he going back to Brampton? He would be back in the OHL for one more because okay. he's the same draft class as Bedard, but next year he'll be able to play in the AHL. That's fine. He'll play with Vanacker once he gets healthy, and uh, that'll yeah. be fun to watch. Mm-hmm. Um, and besides that, I think Camesso looked like a guy who hadn't played all summer. Like, I think that'll be fine. I'm not too stressed about that. Um, because he was with Jeremy Swayman. 
Nolan it's Allen really continues good. to look steady. I think that's another thing that's notable. I think he'll get a call up this year at some point. Mm-hmm. If uh, yeah. especially if like a guy like Martinez or Brody goes down, I think that's the most logical We're call up. Him. It sounds like White Kaiser's getting a lot more praise this year than last mm-hmm. year. So I, once again, a year in Rockford seems to do wonders for these defensemen. If Kaiser's already playing with Murphy in camp, um, I think that's a big giveaway. Uh, and I think the other big giveaway is that, it, and this doesn't involve the prospect tournament, but it looks like Korchinski's on the outside looking in right now, which is another interesting aspect. Yeah, I kind of would have guessed that with all the signings they made. Like, not that I think they were actively like, okay, you're going down to the AHL, but I think they're like, okay, if he doesn't have a great cap, if he doesn't wow us, like, there's no hesitation to send him down. And hopefully, if Lev Shunov is back in time, him. And uh, Korchinski can develop some chemistry in Rockford, and that would be, you know, that'd be, you know, a thing for people to go out and go see Ice Hogs game to see that defensive core down there. Because, yeah, if you go with say a Vlasic Jones again, and then like uh, I don't know Martinez Brody, and then Kaiser Murphy, and you have like some like Phillips up here, like you go down the AHL, you're just potentially seeing Korchinski live shoot off. Allen and Del Mastro, and you're just seeing all this depth that they've accumulated on the back end the past few years, even before Kyle Davidson was GM, all these big, tall, rangy defensemen that have different skill sets, like obviously Korchinski more offensively, Lev Shunov, you're hoping, is the, the whole package, and then guys like Vlasic, Del Mastro, and Nolan Allen, where they're just more kind of defensive guys. Maybe, yeah, they can make the first pass, but you're not expecting a whole bunch of offense. Maybe Vlasic a bit more, but I wouldn't think the case with Del Mastro or or Allen. So yeah, I wonder if that's a thing in the next few years where that becomes like a like a trade, like a, a surplus for them. They make a trade, trade one of those defensemen. But yeah, the defensive core is looking fine. I'm glad they're honestly not rushing Korchinski because I think if they had the choice last year, they would have sent him to the HL with stupid CHL rules. Anyways, another name for me that and I've seen a lot and like saw some highlights was Colton Dak. They don't really have too many big forwards, and that maybe that's maybe like the one like little criticism I have of the forward pipeline is like okay, maybe they don't have too many big forwards like Connor Bedard, Nazar, and more or more. They're a little bit smaller, but then we also mentioned AJ Spalisi earlier, and he seems like a big guy, very athletic guy. And same with Colton Dock, where I think if he, I think he got injured last year. If he didn't get injured, he's probably getting called up. So that's another guy this year. I wouldn't surprise if he got a call up at all and, you know, played in a middle six role and and get some power play time, be a net front guy. So, yeah, just looking at this camp for the first time in a few years, it feels like, you know, there's not crazy expectations, but there's expectations to be like somewhat competitive. So it's nice to see, you know, all these all these battles and camps because you got the guys, you got the few guys who think are going to make the team, but then, you know, young guys like Nazar, maybe Korchinski is in there too. Like they got to work their way on. And if they do, yeah. I I like where, I like where the camp is at right now. And I'm curious to see, you know, what, what the preseason look like. Cause I think they've rolled with some lineups, but they're not, they're they're not going to be the same lineups that these come opening days. So yeah, I'm, 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 I'm just rambling on here. Um, who are some intriguing players for you guys to watch, like before preseason, who you pre or before the season start that you could see maybe making the team? Because for me, it's it is Colton Dock. I I think. I wonder if he gets a shot. Greg, you can go ahead. I, I talked first last time. <laughs> Good. Honestly, I haven't just had a ton of time to watch like any of the scrimmages or like the preseason games or anything. Like, not got not guess not preseason. Um, prospect games, yeah, yeah. yeah. God, my brain is like not <laughs> um, real. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a lot of guys who were in like Rockford last year who showed like a lot of potential. Like, um, Bill Master was like one. Um, oh God, I'm blanking. Yeah, like Doc's another. I'm just kind of interested to see how they do and then see where they fall. A lot of them have shown a lot of improvement, um, where they can fall on this roster or if they're just gonna go back to Rockford. 100%. Uh, I think one that has something to prove in preseason is Martin Mishiak. Uh He did have that yeah, great that's prospect another game. Yeah. Um, he needs to prove something or else he's probably going – well, he's definitely going back to the OHL. But in terms of, um, you know, showing that you could potentially be a top six forward or top nine forward on this team because he, the skill set he brings, he's got to show out because it's he's a skill guy. He's not a – 
He's, he's not going to bring. Too. He's not going to bring any edge to his game like a Banacker or someone or a Spellacy or Spellacy or however you say his name. Um, so I think he's got something to prove. Nazar obviously has something to prove. He can make the. And Richardson's made it very clear he has the capability to make this team out of camp, and I think he will. I think you and I talked about this last night. Mm-hmm. Um, another guy I think that has something to prove right now. Um, but Cat gets him. Yeah, I was no, going to say. Arvid's audible. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Brossois, I don't think he'll be out for that long. Like, he might miss the first week of the regular season. But, yeah, Arvid Soderblom, just anything to to get some confidence going because he'll probably go down to Rockford right as Brossois gets back. But, yeah, you got to take every opportunity. For why you should get another contract mm-hmm. this offseason. Yeah, yeah. And that starts in preseason. Because mm-hmm. I think – we talked about it many times last year. This group thought he could be in one or starting goalie in the NHL, mm-hmm. and he regressed about as bad as he could regress last year. And yeah. it doesn't help when Morazic puts up above average numbers. So it's he's young; he can figure it out. But a good way to get on the right foot with this management group is have a good preseason. I think. Mm-hmm. I feel like Morazic's that guy where he's either going to make the most amazing save you've ever seen, like in your entire life, or it's going to be like. I don't want to say the opposite, but just like kind of a weak goal he gives up. But I felt What's like in a shitter. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Last season, especially like Soderblom, like had all the potential to be like an amazing goalie. And then just, I don't know if it was like nerves or pressure, but just kind of like fell short of what we were expecting. 100%. Yeah, there was there's many many factors. One, the team just sucked. So, yeah. <laughs> you know. and the 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 defense. A lot of the times wasn't great, but it's one of those things where like Z didn't do himself any favors. Like everything just went wrong. It feels like with Soderblom and the team that was playing in front of him, and it's like a kind of a chicken and the egg thing. Like Soderblom think he would want to play better, want to play better if the team in front of him was better, and then it's like, well, the team wants to play better if they know Soderblom could get a save out. So you know, it's like just not. They weren't a very good team, and Morazic obviously is a more experienced goalie who has a bit more of a track record, so it's understandable to see why he was putting up such great numbers. But yeah, over Arvid Sorbom, I think I, I would, I don't, I'm pretty sure he's not waiver eligible, so they can just send him back down. A guy who is uh, waiver eligible is Lucas Reichel, and that's going to be intriguing to watch because he signed a two-year contract th- this offseason, and I don't want to say it's make or break, but if he has a crappy preseason, I mean – you can't they can't just send him down to Rockford. So like do they explore a trade? I don't know. I think this is huge for Lucas Reichel, but then there's the other end of it where he's almost like down the totem pole in this organization. Maybe he might not have as much pressure. And there's I don't, and they sorry. I was just I, I was gonna say I don't know about that. Kyle Davidson expects him to win a top six role out of camp from what he said mm-hmm. today. So the expectations are on him. It's I don't think yeah. it's ever gotten any smaller. I think if anything, it's ramped up a little bit. They're gonna give you a legit opportunity with the guy you played well with two years ago in Kershaw, mm-hmm. and then Tara Biden, who has produced with anyone you put him with. So mm-hmm. you know, it's not up for shutout time. Yeah. Yeah, maybe not like like lower on the like like what I said, but yeah, you you know I know the help there. Yeah, yeah, he he has the help there now. Like you just got to you just got to put together. It sounds like Lucas Reichel is just an overthinker, or it almost sounds like Nick Schmoltz, where it's just like you know the confidence thing. You just got to get going and be more consistent, and hopefully, like the you know the coaching staff and the management is just on him. Just be like, dude, you're so fast, you're so skilled. Like just use that to your advantage. It's obviously easier said than done, but hopefully a, a new year with better line mates than last year, that'll help him to be a more consistent player and at least be like a second line guy where you can maybe pencil them 40, 50 points and be like a second power play kind of guy, something. Cause last year was just horrific, especially after what we saw him being in Germany and him being in Rockford and that brief stand he had a couple of years ago. So. 100%. <clears throat> um. I don't know if there's anything more to talk about the Blackhawks so far. We still got to see some some games to be played. Um, I want to get on to some of the, the contract extensions that have happened. Um, this also happened, I think, a week after we recorded our last show. I want to talk about the Leon Dreisel contract that he signed for eight years, $14 million per. Um, it's, it's like we're going to keep seeing new benchmarks for all these new contracts. I think it was – it was Matthews who signed his contract. He's like, oh, this is the highest AAV by a player. And then, then I think 
know, it was McKinnon who had 12.6 in those Matthews. It was like 13.25. And then now Dry Sales got 14 million AAV. And with the cap going up over these next few years, we're just going to keep seeing that. Like, especially once McDavid hits the market, like, we're just going to keep seeing new benchmarks of like, oh, what's the, you know, the going rate for a superstar now? And I would think once McDavid gets there, that's at least like 16, maybe even 17 million. So, it's finally nice to see the cap going up. It's finally nice to see, you know, these superstars get pay, paid for what they're they're worth because uh, Leon Dreisaitl was massively underpaid for most of that contract. And I remember when that contract was signed, it was like, oh, it's a little bit of a, a little bit of an overpay, even though he had a, a great playoffs. But yeah, and for the Oilers now, it's like, it's really this year because I think Bouchard is up next year or the year after that, like, I would have to go take a look at uh, at Puckpedia, but yeah, regardless for the Oilers, like this is almost a, it's a must win year coming into this year. But it's good that they got that that contract done. Yeah, um, I you know I don't know why it, the second they lost in the Cup final, they're like, oh, I don't know if they're going to resign Drysaddle. Why wouldn't he? They lost by one goal. Like they lost the Stanley Cup final by one goal. Why would you leave this team at all right now? Granted. The decisions they made afterwards are questionable uh, or before, yeah. but you know, on ice they did get better. I want to say, mm-hmm. um, whether I agree with some of the moves or not, and you know, Dry Settle's gonna get like Dry Settle's probably gonna play with Jeff Skinner, and that's gonna be a nasty combination. Mm-hmm. Um, and you always just have the nuclear option with McDavid, and one way to sure. ensure that ninety-seven sticks around is paying twenty-nine out the shoot. So. Mm-hmm. Can't really complain in that regard if you're an Oilers fan. Yeah, help study the waters because there was like, oh, maybe Dreisaitl doesn't sign, and again, rarely and and hockey doesn't happen that a superstar of that magnet. Like if Leon Dreisaitl went to free agency, he would probably be the biggest free agent to ever hit the market. No, like because to me, he's bigger than Tavares, better than Panarin. This is a guy that's won a heart and isn't like an all-time playoff performer. So. Yeah, Connor McDavid two years left this year and the next year, like he's eligible to sign a contract extension come uh, July first. Um, I just had Evan Bouchard. So Evan Bouchard has one more year left at three point nine, and then he's an RFA this offseason with uh, arbitration rights. So uh, with all the players they have, to me, this is their really their year to go for it. And and then the year after that, at Combs, a uh, free agent as well. Like, yeah, they got they got to win this year. It's crazy that it took them this long to build a team to to get to a cup contender level with all the draft high end draft picks they've had like over like ten years ago. Now that they're finally figuring it out, but man, hopefully this year is the year they do it. Hundred um, percent. It's wide open. It's always wide open in the West, I feel like. And mm-hmm. as long as you got 97 and 29, you can win any game. Mm-hmm. Just, just hope your goaltending doesn't fall off a cliff again. Yeah. Um, they really just need another right-handed defenseman. I think they brought in Travis Dermott on a, on a PTO. Like, at home in Bouchard, you can, you can pencil that in as a, a great top pairing. But then after that, like, Darnell Nurse with – Josh Brown or Ember Sinner, Troy Stetcher is that that would should be your third pairing. Like you need at least one more defenseman in there. And it looks like with a Vander Kane going on the LTIR, they're going to have some cap space to play with and not matching uh, Groberg and Holloway. Like they'll have some cap space to, to play with come the trade deadline. I'm interested to see how uh, Stan Bowman handles that. So um, probably like, more notable that's happened recently. I want to talk about the the Red Wings locking up Mason Raymond and, and Moritz Sider. And this is an interesting one to me because I was talking with this uh, to Dylan last night about like, oh, are these contracts good for Raymond and Sider? I kind of want to hear your your thoughts first and what you think about them. Uh, yeah. I mean, we we talked about it last night. I think that Raymond deal is a steal for Detroit. Um, mm-hmm. well, I think they both are, yeah. <laughs> If I'm Raymond's agent, I would have wanted an extra mil a year. He's going to be mm-hmm. worth it by the end of that. Um, cap's only going up. The one I get hung up on is Cider to an extent because, like we had this talk last night, how many years can you put up bad analytics before you're the problem? I said three years. I genuinely. Yeah. Um, and we said three years, so this is the this is the prove-it year. Um, mm-hmm. 
like we see this all the time with athletes that fans love. They're going to point fingers at everyone but the person that, you know, seems to be the common denominator. Yeah. Um, it's something against Cider. I think he can be a good defenseman. We talked about this. I think he has the ceiling to be like a Seth Jones, who's a good top pairing guy. But at some point, you have to become the guy who elevates your competition, to, not the guy that doesn't need to be elevated by his partner. Um, like we said it time and time again, Seth – literally play with Jack Johnson and put up elite analytics. Um, Victor Hedman yeah, played with fucking, tell you that. Yeah. Victor Hedman <laughs> plays with like Darren Radish most games and he puts up elite analytics. Like I'm an on ice production too. So I just think at some point Cider has to take a step in his development. And if he does, he's going to be an elite defenseman. There's no other way around it. Uh, the offensive talent's there. The physicality's there. If you could just work, sharpen that defensive game a little bit, that contract's going to be more than a steal for Detroit. But there's also the part of me that thinks, you know, what if this is just who he is and he's, you know, up and down, middle of the pairing guy and you're paying him eight mil. That's that's where I get concerned a little bit. But the best part is he's, what, 23? Like, he's got time. Mm -hmm. um, I just think you got to show some sort of growth five on five this year for me to personally have some conf confidence in that extension. That's just me, though. Yeah, I do agree with that. It's interesting, like like you said, all blame over everyone around him except for him himself. And I think there's like a little bit of both. Like, yeah, sucks playing with Ben. Chirot I'm not saying Ben Chirot's elite. I yeah, want to, yeah, I want to yeah, yeah. start that off, but it's yeah. I don't know, man. I've just seen I've seen elite defensemen elevate their talent Let's just, mm -hmm. or elevate their what, Let's just put Yeah, that's way. yeah. What I'm trying to say, like Ben Chirot, probably not. I I haven't looked at the stats, but probably he's probably best to putting your bottom pairing even if you're paying them more like a top four defenseman but yeah if you're truly that good more exciter should be able to at least like keep his head above water and it seems like that hasn't been the case but you're just hoping like internally with the red wings with all the prospects that they have coming up that like cider just naturally progresses as a 23 year old all the physical tools he has the offense defense skating physicality all that you're I would kind of think what in the case of the Red Wings, like you would hope Simon Edvidson just comes up and is able to take over that top pairing and you can just set pencil in Edvidson and Cider for the next decade. And then that contract just looks like an absolute steal. I honestly like thought like a bridge deal would have made more sense for Cider because like what, what you said, what, what you said earlier, I think there's so much more to prove where it's like, okay, if I, you know, really step over the next couple of years, yeah, I'm making less money now, but then I can get a massive payday with the uh, the, the cap going up. I mean, yeah, seven years. I, I mean, when you get put that kind of money in front of you, almost $60 million, it's hard to turn it down. And I think that could end up being a good contract for both Sider and the Red Wings. But yeah, Lucas Raymond is really, that's just a slam dunk easy right there. How great he was down the stretch last season, the offensive skill he has. Like, yeah, I would have seen if I could have gotten an extra million dollars or whatever. And I think it was the Quinn Byfield contract in LA where it was like, okay, I took a bit of a discount, but, you know, the years I have, it's going to take me right up to my free agency. I wonder if we're going to see more of those kind of contracts where with the cap going up players are going to bet more of themselves where it's like yeah i'll take a bit of a discount if we got a good team maybe i could you know win a cup you know put up some good seasons and then cash in once i'm like 26 27 28 and free agency but also again like when you're getting 60 million dollars plus to if dangled in front of your face it's hard to say no but yeah once the cap keeps going up that's going to be an absolute steal with the Red Wings, especially for Raymond Cider, it's, it's, it's going to be a little more interesting to see how that plays out. Yeah, I agree. For sure. <clears throat> um, another extension that happened, I think there was like a few other, like Crosby got extended. I don't think there's really much of a, of a surprise there. Like, <laughs> Guys, yeah, what was the number he took per year? I bet it was not 8.7 again, that's for sure. <laughs> Yeah, it's not what he's not haven't been making the past like almost twenty years or whatever. Honestly, it's such a fucking Chad move. I love it. I love <laughs> yeah, it. he's the he's like, really the only Crosby guy do his thing. Yeah, Ovechkin mm -hmm. would never take eight mil a year. It says a lot. <laughs> <laughs> eight point eight eight for eight years for Ovechkin. Yeah, <laughs> screw it. I guess I got to pay Bedard ninety eight million dollars a year to counteract it. <laughs> 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 this is what I said with with Bedard. Like he's gonna get 
his extension announced like on his 20th birthday when he's eligible to extend. And then he's going to get paid 98 million over eight years, which I think is like 12.25. And then they're going to name him the captain that day. But with Nick Foligno being captain, that might wait for another year. But I think that's going to happen with the contract extension. At least that's my thought. Um, another another big contract, another another young guy, um, Dylan Gunther, getting eight years. I think at like 7.1 something million dollars. It was like a weird number, but yeah, it's it's crazy now that. You know, the formerly the Arizona Coyotes are moved to a place with stable ownership that they can just spend their money. And really, these last couple of years, it's hard to keep track of all this young talent. So when I see these contracts going on, I'm like, oh, that's a lot of money. But then you look at the stats and like, okay, I see why they got paid all that money. Like Dylan Genther was um, highly regarded going into his draft year, was an oil king. And you've heard so much hype around him. And I'm like, I went to go check his stats this year. He had, um, 35 points in 45 games, which is very good over the pace of an 82 game season. That's like 63 points. Like he's only going to get better. The team around him going to get better. And again, that's just going to be another steal. Yeah, we just see all these players getting the bag right now, but they're they're all going to be steals within the next year, uh, next few years. You just wonder like, what if they waited a, a couple of years? And I think Dawson Mercer signed a, a three year contract with the Devils, so. Maybe that could work out in his favor where if he just takes off playing it's alongside like Jack Hughes, then he can get the bag when he's like 26, 27. So yeah, a lot of lot of contracts, a lot of a lot of extensions. Um, but maybe most notably, the one that hasn't signed yet, and probably the most intriguing to me is uh Jer- Jeremy Swayman hasn't signed yet. And he's interesting because he's probably the best goalie in the NHL right now that hasn't been a legitimate number one just because he's been playing with Linus Olmark, like the top five goalies you think of, Hellebuck, Shesterkin, I don't know if you put Vasilevsky in there right now, but when he's on top of this game, he is. Um, I would put Saros in there, Onger. Like, Swayman hasn't gotten, you know, like he hasn't played more than 50 games. I think the most games he's played in this season is like 43 or 44 games. But to me, that's just, he has all the leverage there. If Don Sweeney trades away Linus Olmark and can't get a Swayman contract down, like what the what the hell was the point of that? Yeah, uh, we talked about this last night. I think they mm-hmm. completely fumbled in terms of where you wanted your leverage in this situation because yeah. I think you extend Swayman while you still have Hallmark. That yeah. gives you all the control in the world over how you go about that contract. Mm-hmm. And then you still have Olmark in your back pocket if he holds out. Um, obviously, your trade value with Olmark does plummet a little bit, but like mm-hmm. you got picked 25 for him. Like, yeah. I don't think... I don't know. It's just questionable how Don Sweeney went about what he valued in this situation. And it sounded like he valued a first round pick more than he valued signing Swayman up to a reasonable contract. And now he has zero leverage in a situation where Swayman knows the ball's in his court. Um, and Don Sweeney has no one to blame but himself on that one, I think. Uh, Swayman's worth at least eight. I think we've talked about this before. But if you had Olmark, you probably could have got him for seven. That's just the reality. Um, we can talk about it every time with other teams. Look at Soros. Um, you know, Askarov had to get traded because Soros signed a good deal, and they mm-hmm. still got a hell of a haul for Askarov. So, That's like, you can see though. how two teams went about it, and I think it's night and day. I think the Nashville went about it the right way, even though they traded the younger goalie. They extended the one that's really I think they knew who their term. goalie was. Yeah. Bingo. Like, got Bingo. Got extended, yeah. And Boston sounds like they know who theirs is, too. I just would have extended him sooner. That's just me. And I know Reagan's a big swaming guy. Yeah. <laughs> big swaming gal. Yeah. Then like, that's like, like you said, like, since they traded Allmark first, the ball is in Swayman's court. So, like, what if he decides to just be like, screw you and walk? Like, then what does Boston do? Because you had two phenomenal goaltenders and then they both are gone because you decided to trade uh, Allmark before re signing Swayman. I don't 100%. know. Just- and. And we'll not even talk about, like, if he's not signed in October, this is a team that started off white hot the last two years, and that's a big reason that they, you know, had either a good regular season or made it to the playoffs. So mm-hmm. who's to say that in Marchand's coming off three surgeries this offseason? Like, yeah. it's going to be – I mean, obviously they made some great signings. They got Lindholm and Sidorov, but mm-hmm. – um if you don't have your elite goaltender, you're kind of shit out of luck. So, 
We'll see. But like Pierce and I joked about it last night. Corpus is probably just going to become a lead. Oh, the Corpus man. Yeah. Nice Brendan Bussy's going to come up and yeah. just go crazy. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to go Bussy mode, epic style. Literally. Um, but like, literally, like, that's what's going to happen. Um, like, w- we had Lauren Campbell on and she talked about this. Like, Bussy is ready in the AHL. So if Corpus Isle can't figure it out or Swayman's not signed, they'll call him up. So yeah. they might be fine. I might be overreacting, yeah. but I just think in terms of long term, you know, not making your best player angry or second yeah, best player bring angry. The bridge, bring the bridge 100%. with a goalie of that caliber. Yeah, again, it's a it is an interesting negotiating process because of what I said. Like like from Don Sweeney's end, it's like, well, yeah, you put up good numbers, but you haven't played any more than like forty three games a season. But then also Swayman's like, Yeah, look at the numbers I put up in the playoffs. I think he's a nine twenty goalie playoffs and regular season. Like it's so hard to get that, especially of a goalie at that age and right now in the NHL. So yeah, you're you're looking at the cap space everyone has signed besides him. Uh, they roughly have eight point six million dollars. I'm like, yeah, I want eight point six million dollars for. I, I don't know how. I don't know if he wants like seven or eight years, but yeah, I'm, I'm starting with that money point at least, and then being like, okay, we'll go figure out the term. So yeah, yeah it's just watching Don Sweeney be like, like, I think he brought up December first. I don't know if it's gonna last that long because the last one. It was the that I can think of went that long was the William Newlander one. I think it was 2018, and that went right down to I think the last minute on on December 1st. I don't think that's gonna happen, but also like the more and more time passes, like the December, like you have time, but December 1st is gonna be there sooner than you know it. So mm-hmm. I hopefully for the sake of the uh, Don Sweeney and the Bruins that like they figure out something soon, and and like the you know nothing you know the relationship there isn't too bad cuz usually when it comes to RFA and kind of negotiating and arbitration i feel like that's where things can go m- most sour so yeah that'll be that'll definitely be interesting to see how it plays out i think the only other one i could think of that's unsigned for our phase is Cole Perfetti and that's also an interesting one but that's less money involved so i don't know why Winnipeg hasn't gotten that done but yeah, I don't know if there's any closing thoughts on the Swayman thing, but I almost feel that like that's one of the, the, the bigger stories, at least in terms of contracts. I think it's interesting that like Boston had like two goalies to where it's like if you're the away team, like well, no matter who's the net, it's a really good goalie. And they didn't lock one of them down. And now we're like a couple weeks away from the season and they still like they got rid of one of them, but they didn't lock the other one down. I just think it's so interesting the way they went about this. 100%. Um, and obviously, this could be fixed the next week. Like, that's the beauty of it. Oh, you can so. sign a night, and no one would be surprised. Yeah. Facts. So, we'll, we'll just play it by ear, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And I just also wonder with Swayman, like, how much time do you want to lose? So, like, again, I think he has all the leverage, but I wonder if there's, like, a part of Swayman where it's like, okay, maybe I'll take a little bit less. I just want to keep start playing because that can be a thing. These guys don't want to miss time. But also, again, this is a golden opportunity for you to get the money with all that leverage. So, yeah, there's a lot of... A lot of angles to look at it, but you know, knowing the Bruins, their luck with goalies the past like 15, 20 years, Corpus Sal is gonna be like a 920, and the Bussy's gonna come up be like a 910, 915, and probably be able to hold it till Swayman signs. So, oh, it could be almost a bit of a mute point, but definitely interesting to look at. Um, I think interesting. Like, he's gonna sign like as soon as we like finish recording, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what did happen before the podcast? So uh, Logan O'Connor signing a six-year contract with the with the Colorado Avalanche. But uh, yeah, I think you said right out before we started the show, Schmidt. It's like, yeah, six years, but he's only making two and a half million. That's going to be the going price for for fourth liners going forward. And I think he's only 27, 28. So yeah, that takes him till till his mid thirties. So. Um, I'm very excited for this. So I don't think not that this upcoming week, but next Friday, um, Amazon documentary that they've been filming over the past year, last season, um, is going to be released on October 4th. It's called Face Off Inside the NHL, um, and it'll be on Amazon Prime. Um, I think some people have had like been able to view it early, and they said like, "Oh, it's it's great." So I'm I'm really looking forward to that because we just we so rarely ever see like really behind the scenes. 
Um, I know the Oilers, they have, I think it's Oilers TV or Oilers Plus or whatever, and they released that. You have to pay for it, but they there was that clip of the, the Oilers sitting in that dressing room after Game 7 loss and it just being complete silence, but you can still hear the outside of, like, oh, Connor McDavid won the con Smythe and just, like, seeing their reactions that time and be like, I fucking know we're going to be back there next year. So, like, that's a little appetizer. I can't wait to see how the rest goes, like, I know I think David Pasternak's in and William Nylander, so we're going to get to see the whole Boston-Toronto first-round thing work out. I'm pretty sure both McDavid and Drysdale are there, so we're going to get to follow that whole playoff run. So I'm just really looking forward to it because hockey, I feel, is now in a golden era. There's so many stars. Like, yeah, the NHL is a bit far behind in terms of, like, basketball and football to that, but getting to see the best of the best in the sport – all the top players getting to see more like in behind scenes where it sounds like the teams didn't really have much of a say, like the people just went in. It's like, they don't have too much of a say what's edited out. So just seeing a lot of raw unedited stuff, like that's going to be so much fun. Cause I think there was the Leafs documentary that came out a few years ago and it was during the COVID season. It just felt like the Leafs had so much say over what was going to be in it. And it's just like, Oh, they lost in seven games. And that's the end of the story. Like there's nothing like them just saying like, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm really looking really looking forward to it to see really a different side of the NHL that we haven't seen much. Just yeah, it's, it's going to be like what they used to do on NBC Sports like a decade ago. So that'll be fun. Oh, you're so right. What was it? The the thirty NHL, NHL thirty six. Oh Canes was awesome. I mean, he had his own Cadoba burrito. I remember that. That was funny. <laughs> uh, yeah, the one with the twenty. That is that's so fucking crazy. I mean, when I think of I'm things like that. I had. <laughs> It's just that these, I think of, it's weird because with hockey, I, I always think of the, the NHL video games and like some of the stuff that they did back then. I'm like, oh, that's so cool. Why don't they add that to the new games? And then it's like the NHL itself did these crazy marketing things. I'm like, why haven't been they been doing that more? Like NHL in 36 was so good. It was the Blackhawks one. I think they did a bit with Andrew Shaw and then I think it was Patrick Kane and then they kind of just did the whole team that 2013 Hawks team. There's one with Nick Lidstrom. I remember there's one with Patrice Bergeron. And it's just why why did we stop doing that? So it's gonna be cool to see the best of the best, like the superstars, getting to get more of a bit of a deep dive into like their process and how they think the game, how they play the game. Yeah. Perfect time to do it too. I feel like every team's got at least some form of a superstar on their team. Yeah. Going from San Jose with Celebrini, who had some nasty plays in preseason last night to all the way up to the Stanley Cup champions of Matthew Kachuk and Alex Barkov. Um, yeah. There's talent Matthew all across Kachuk the board. Too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's talent all across the board, and um, it's going to be exciting just to see some behind-the-scenes looks at all of it, for sure. Yeah, and then you hope in, like, the next few years that Connor Bedard will be in it and, like, maybe Macklin celebrating in kind of more of a new wave. Like, I, maybe Jack Hughes is in, I don't think Jack Hughes is in this one, so – like, again, there's just so much young talent, and there's going to be even more over the next few years out to the NHL that you can make a whole, like, completely new documentary with completely different players. So, um, that's all I really have for the notes. I don't know if you guys have any, like, points you want to touch on before we get into the Twitter questions, and then we can wrap this up. Um, Isn't Arizona or Utah going to announce their team name soon? That's exciting. I didn't see that. Um, and... I, what else is there? There was something else I wanted to bring up. Oh, uh, Thomas Harley, I think, got signed to a pretty good extension. It was like two times four, something like uh, that. Yeah. Um, that's yeah, pretty just sure, a deal. Yeah. As a I, got locked up. Like, uh-huh. Dallas is doing the right thing once again. What else that's what they always do. Oh, and Victor it's, Hedman's captain. We've got to talk about that. <laughs> um, yeah, we talked about Nick Foligno being captain. It's like when uh, Victor Hedman – Got, I think it was announced the same day. It's literally just a video of like people be desperate for attention. I can't believe they do that on uh, Nick Foligno's. Literally, bro. Story. No original experiences. <laughs> um, Ryan Kildude as captain of the Anaheim Ducks. Which, yeah, dude. Good for him, man. Like, I think Jay Fresh posted it. He was like, everyone just has it in his mind that Radko Gudis is just this enforcer defenseman who sucks. And it's like, no, he's actually been a very good defensive defenseman for the past few years. And it's just like, oh, he doesn't put up crazy numbers. And he plays in Anaheim. So that makes sense. And also the Leafs fans are show to you what he did when he was on Florida. So uh, I mean, maybe they just hate him. Mm-hmm. But yeah. yeah um, I... Mm-hmm. Was anyone else named captain, or was that it? I can't. That was it. The only other thing we didn't talk about was uh, Seth Jarvis. I think got signed to a very good extension. Um, 
That's yeah. a top line winger on on Carolina, and they locked him up seven years at a very reasonable rate. That contract's going to be a steal. In the interesting thing about that, country. yeah, the interesting about that contract was like the deferred payments on it or whatever. Yeah, that's new. Eric Tolsky, man, already doing some crazy shit first mm-hmm. offseason. And really, it's been a thing for a while, so I'm surprised why more teams haven't done that. Or it's just because it's a boys things. club. Yeah, I was gonna say it's just one of those things where someone needs to do it once, and then like everyone else will start doing it. Of course, Eric Tulski would be the first one to do that. Kind of go back to Dallas. Um, like the, the, I, I thought it was cool that the Blues did offer sheet Holloway and Broberg and got both of them, but I could be wrong. He might have not been arbitrate or like offer sheet eligible. Well, well, why did no team try to offer sheet Thomas Harley? Like. From what I saw with the stats and the numbers, like that guy, if he's not a top pairing defenseman now, he's going to be like what? Like, I don't think Dallas was in a crazy bind, but why wouldn't anyone like just try to offer him? Like, did the same thing, overpay him for like a couple of years, and then, and then just figure it out because he's a good defenseman. But yeah, whatever. Maybe we'll get more offer sheets over the next few years. Again, hopefully that's something that opens the door. But then we thought that with Kukkini. I mean, I'm pretty sure that's like the first one where. You know, a player accepted and actually went to a different team. So, um, mm-hmm. yeah, there's gonna there's a bunch of stuff that's happened. Like we've only done a few podcasts over the past couple of months since off season hit, so we're probably not gonna get to, to everything. But it feels like the main stuff here. Let's get into some uh, Twitter questions here. Um, I put the PJ's cast is returning tonight. Do you have any questions for the show? We got we have four questions. Um, MB put this. Who is having the worst training camp? And I think this is this is a hard question to answer because uh, we have barely played any preseason games yet. Yet, Martin Mishiak and Kevin Korshinsky need to prove something. <laughs> That's like, I where I'll leave that. Yeah, MP, I don't even know what to what to say to that. Um, if we were talking Leafs fans, it would be Max Pacioretty because he scored uh, two goals in, in last night against Ottawa, even though they lost with uh, Jakob Schuck scoring the overtime winner. Get was, excited, Sense Nation. We're making the playoffs. It wasn't the first goal for Utah an own goal. <laughs> oh, yeah. I did not Blues, see that. I forgot about that. No, it was an own goal. I was and the, Blue, and the Blues account was like, congrats on your first ever goal. And I'm pretty sure it was an own goal on the empty <laughs> now delay of game. <laughs> That's right. I forgot about that. <laughs> I saw like um, next- said something like, uh, you can take the team out of Arizona, but you can't take the Arizona out of the team. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> it's so true, though. Oh, my gosh. I love this question from Connor. Why is the Blackhawks goal- Black goalie tandem the best in the league? I mean. The annual ticks don't lie. So. Yeah. The don't number. Know, it's there. Yeah. Um, kind of talked about this a little earlier, I guess, or something similar to it. Jacob said, who's a surprise Hawk that could make the roster? And I think mine still is Colton Doc, especially if they want to add more size and, like, maybe put a forward on, a different forward on waivers if they don't do too well. Wyatt Kaiser, I think, is the one right yeah. now that I'm looking at. Um, and I think Spellacy might even get a game. If he keeps this up, and he if he gets a game, damn, like that'd be cool. Yeah, that's my hot. That's like a pipe dream fun, but clearly the coach likes him. He's playing with Donato and Joey Anderson. Those are two guys that will be on the NHL team mm-hmm. this year. So we'll see. Yeah, it's one of those things where it's like, okay, maybe you're not going to be on the team this year, but this if you go back to to winter and have a great year, this bodes well for you in the future. Mm-hmm. For sure. And the last question. From our good pal Vish, on what game will Tyler Bertuzzi score his 30th goal of the season? Um, whenever the Blackhawks play in Toronto, whether that is <laughs> in like November or like in March, I don't know. He's going to score it in Toronto, though. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, for Dude. sure. Mm-hmm. When do the Blackhawks play the Leafs in Toronto? Need to find <laughs> out. This is great radio right now. <laughs> Get excited. <laughs> Blackhawks versus Maple Leafs, if my phone even wants to load. 2024. 
Okay, so they're in <laughs> they're in Toronto on December second. That's when Tyler Bertuzzi is going to score his thirtieth goal. He's going to have like thirty goals in probably less than thirty games. It's happening. Get excited, Leafs Nation. April seventh. April seventh. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Big. Real, realistically, real answer. Yeah, like I could see Bertuzzi getting a 30-30 this year. I think that's definitely realistic if he plays with uh, Bedard. As it stands right now, like a bunch of line movements are gonna have, like changes are gonna happen before even the preseason starts and the regular season starts. Like, what, what, how do we want the lines configured right now? Like, do we want to, like, do we want to load the first line, put Bertuzzi and Table with Bedard, or do we kind of like split that up, maybe put Table with Frank and then have Bertuzzi and, and Bedard together? Oh yeah, him and Hall are gonna be a fun combo, I think, and then. I don't know the way they're lining up the top six right now. It's going to be interesting for sure because I think that right were, could do some damage. Because mm-hmm. they were doing what Bertuzzi, um, Bedard, and Hall, and the Wolves. It's good to see Hall healthy too, man. Like I know yeah. he was healthy at the end of last year, but like he looks like he's one hundred percent ready to go from what it sounds mm-hmm. like. Yeah, I got yeah, twelve games just... of him last year. Like <laughs> if he can even get sixty, I'll be happy. Yeah. Yeah, what's more likely, really Taylor happen. Hall and Bertuzzi play sixty games each, or Bertuzzi gets thirty goals? What's more? What's more likely? Oh, that's a tough one. Honestly, I want to say Tyler Bertuzzi thirty goals, just because you would have to even if Taylor Hall plays sixty games, like he could play sixty games of the season. I just wonder if they're all going to be at the Blackhawks. Does he maybe get traded? Mm-hmm. Uh, right. Boy, yeah, then who would be the second line? Would it be like Nazar, Tavo, and Kurashev? That's what the line is right now. Yeah. The line rushes. Mm-hmm. No, no, it's uh, it's Kershev, Reichel, and Teravainen. That's why I'm saying yeah. like they're giving yeah. Reichel a legit look in camp right mm-hmm. now, mm-hmm. Um, more than it's he got good. last year. With hey, we're gonna make you a center, even though you've never been a center in any position in the league besides like Germany. Have fun. Yeah. <laughs> well, at least but, you uh, got these guys on your wing now. <laughs> oh yeah, and then Nazar's on the kid line, so he'll just yeah, have fun yeah. there with Doc and Lardis. <laughs> That's that is the kid line. That's so cool. These are yeah. artists have good chemistry. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Nick Lardis, I feel, is going to be a guy like again, not this year, but maybe next year. Like he's going to be in the HL regardless, and then maybe he gets a call up and a guy who can who can skate and put the puck in the net. So yeah, it. We still need a couple of weeks for things to fully work out, but we're kind of slowly starting to see things shift together. You know, we're already overreacting to the, to, to the lineups as all NHL teams are. This is the time of the year where everyone's kind of at square one, where everything's mostly equal, where maybe you don't think you're going to want to stack up championship, but maybe in the case of the Blackhawks, like they're, the mindset in the room is like, we, got, we can we can make the playoffs. Like there's a tier of teams that think they, they can win a cup. And then there's a t- probably a tier team's like, okay, maybe we can make a push for the playoffs, and that's where the the Blackhawks are at. So yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward forward to the season. I'm looking forward to doing the podcast more consistently. Like it's always nice to do with you guys. I like, get we all got busy lives, but whenever we get the the chance to do us, it's always a lot of fun. We're gonna try to do it at least once a week and kind of kind of go from there. Because I feel like the last couple of years I've like worked over like oh we're gonna do two a week and then we just never end up doing it. So maybe if I maybe if I <laughs> under under deliver this year maybe we'll do better. So but no, it, it was fun doing this with you guys. I don't know if you guys have any closing thoughts or we can wrap that up here. I'm um, good to go. Season starting up soon. It's so mm-hmm. it, it snuck up on me honestly. Like first preseason games in two days. Freaking mm-hmm. regular season starts what like the. 10th or something? I don't know. Yeah, I reactivated Open our night. Yeah, I reactivated our fantasy league yesterday. I was like, oh shit, I actually gotta like schedule that draft soon because that season's like <laughs> on the it's corner. When did that happen? It's coming up, baby. Let's go. Get excited. Oh, it's it's, it's all happening. October really just is the best time of the year. Mm-hmm. I, in my in my humble opinion, like Football is underway. Basketball is underway. Like baseball playoffs are like the best of sports this year. We're gonna see the, the starting yeah, of the NHL season. Get always, excited! It's the best because you get all four major sports at the same time. It's pretty good. Yeah, and I like either at the beginning of the season or in the case of baseball, like you got the playoffs. Like you're at the start and the beginning, like the most exciting parts. So, mm-hmm. so it's gonna be a fun time. I'm excited. Hell yeah! Big All right, y'all. Once again, 
it was nice having you on the show. Um, to our listeners, our great listeners, uh, please give us a five-star re- review on your preferred podcast platform. If you're watching our beautiful faces on YouTube, be sure to hit the like and subscribe button. You, w- I would even say go ahead and smash it. So, um, yeah. Thank you all for tuning in, and we'll talk next week. Peace out, y'all.